Hi, my name's Dr. Karen Marsh. I'm a research fellow in the Research School of Biology at the Australian National University. My expertise is in plant herbivore interactions, and I'm particularly interested in eucalypt leaves as food for arboreal marsupials. So today I'm going to be talking about some of the work that many different people in our group have done over the last 40 years to understand eucalypt leaves as a food source for marsupial folivores. So I'll start by explaining who are the marsupial folivores, what we know about what they eat and why they eat some eucalypts but not others. And during that process, I'll be telling you about the nutritional composition of eucalypt leaves, how it varies naturally between eucalypt trees and species, and what this means at a landscape scale for the animals that feed on them. So when I talk about eucalypt folivores, I'm talking about marsupial species that consume large amounts of eucalypt leaves. Koalas and greater gliders are specialist eucalypt folivores. They eat very little other than eucalypt leaves. Ringtail possums can eat a diet that is predominantly eucalypt leaves, but they will also eat some other leaves and flowers. Brushtail possums are more generalist feeders, so they often eat a variety of different fruits, flowers, and leaves. However, they can eat a diet that's mostly eucalypt leaves when they're living in eucalypt forests. Eucalypt folivores can be very particular about what they eat, and they prefer to eat some eucalypt species or even some individual trees over others. To give you a bit of an extreme example of what that preference can look like in the wild, this photo was taken at Cape Otway in Victoria. The trees on the right were managums, one of the preferred browse species of koalas, while the trees on the left are nestmate, which is a less preferred species. The koalas at Cape Otway got to such high densities that many of the managums died because they couldn't keep up with the rate at which they were being browsed. And the nestmates, on the other hand, survived because they weren't being browsed to anywhere near the same extent as the managums. And these kinds of preferences can be driven by the chemical composition of eucalypt leaves. Eucalypt leaves contain a variety of essential dietary constituents such as water, fiber, sugars and starch, vitamins and minerals, and protein. And they also contain an array of other compounds known as plant secondary metabolites. And I'm gonna talk about two of the constituents, protein and plant secondary metabolites, because they have a really strong influence on what marsupial folivores choose to eat, where they live, and the quality of their habitat. So for those of you that have never heard of plant secondary metabolites before, they're a really large group of compounds that can have lots of different functions within a plant. And some of them are really interesting from an animal nutrition perspective because they can influence which foods animals eat or how many nutrients they can access from a food. So for example, some secondary metabolites taste spicy or bitter, such as the compounds that make chili spicy. And these sorts of compounds can deter animals from eating a particular plant that otherwise contains plenty of nutrients. Then you've got some secondary metabolites like tannins, which you've probably heard of from tea and wine, and they can bind to nutrients and make them less digestible. So when a plant contains high concentrations of tannins, the plant may be less valuable as a food source because animals may not be able to access all of the plant's protein. And then finally, you get some secondary metabolites that are toxic. And cyanide's a really good example of a well-known toxic secondary metabolite. Now, the effects of ingesting plant secondary metabolites depend on lots of different things, but some of these include the concentration of the secondary metabolite, the amount ingested, the time frame over which it's ingested, and also the detoxification capacity of the animal at the time that it's ingesting the secondary metabolite. So you can think of it a bit like ingesting alcohol. The effects of alcohol depend on how strong the drink is. So for example, whether it's a light beer or whiskey, whether you choose to have a full schooner or just a shot glass, whether you scull the drink as quickly as possible or take sips from it over the course of an hour, and whether there's 
already other alcohol in your system from a previous drink that your body's already trying to metabolize. So you can adjust the way in which you consume the alcohol to minimize any negative effects. So in addition to this, different animal species can metabolize toxins in different ways or at different rates. So that means that some compounds are more toxic for some animals than others. So for example, koalas are much better at detoxifying the secondary metabolites in eucalypt leaves than people. So koalas can eat eucalypt leaves, but people can't. But it can also get differences between eucalypt folivores. So just because one folivore species is good at detoxifying specific eucalypt secondary metabolites doesn't mean that they all will be. Eucalypt leaves contain lots of different types of plant secondary metabolites with different effects. And I'm going to talk about a couple of them now that influence how much eucalypt folivores eat. So the first is a group of chemicals called FPCs. And this figure shows brush tail and ring tail possums fed eucalypt leaves containing different concentrations of a particular FPC called cideroxalanol. The amount eaten by brush tail possums is shown with the points and the line at the top of the figure. And you've got ring tail possums with the points and line at the bottom. So the starting points for the two possums are different because brush tails are bigger, so they generally eat more than ring tails. Each of the dots on the figure represents a different individual tree with a specific concentration of cideroxalanol. So what this graph shows us is that both possum species eat the most when they're offered leaves with low concentrations of FPCs and they eat the least when the leaves contain high FPC concentrations. And it's also worth noting that ringtail possums are deterred much more strongly by FPCs than brush tails. The other group of chemicals is the UBFs. So when brush tail and ringtail possums are fed foods containing a UBF called pinocembrin, it has stronger effects on brush tail possums than ringtails, which is the opposite of what it was for FPCs. So brush tail possums very quickly start to eat less as UBF concentrations increase, whereas ringtail possums eat similar amounts across a broad range of UBF concentrations. And the different responses of the possum species to FPCs and UBS is quite important for understanding their diets in the wild because they tend to eat different eucalypt species. Now the eucalyptus genus contains about 700 different species, which can be divided into eight subgenera. And the two largest of the subgenera are the monocalypse with about 125 species and the cynthia myrtles with about 550 species. The monocalypse includes species like the peppermints, the ashes and the stringy barks, as well as snow gums in the picture here. Uh, and the cynthia myrtles include most of the other gums, including the manna gums in the picture, as well as boxes and iron barks. And in most situations, forests and woodlands contain a mixture of species from both of the subgenera. Now, the reason I'm giving you a lesson in eucalypt taxonomy is because UBFs can be found in species from the monocalypse subgenus, but they don't occur in cynthia myrtles. And the opposite is true for FPCs. So they're found in species from the cynthia myrtle subgenus, but not in monocalypse. And the proportion of eucalypt species known to be important for ours for the possums also differs between the subgenera. So these pie charts give you an overview of the types of eucalypts that both possum species eat across their range. They don't necessarily represent the composition of their diets on a day-to-day -day basis. What they do show, however, is that about three quarters of the eucalypt species known to be eaten by ringtail possums are from the monocalypse subgenus, while brushtail possums eat much fewer monocalypse species and a larger number of species from the cynthia myrtle subgenus. And that fits with their responses to FPCs and UBFs. So if you remember, ringtail possums were more tolerant of UBFs, the compounds found in monocalypse, while brush tails were more tolerant of FPCs, the compounds in cynthia myrtles. Based on what we know about greater gliders and koalas, greater gliders also eat a large number of monocalypse species and probably sit somewhere in between ringtails and brush tails while koalas eat a larger number of cynthia myrtle species more similar to brush tails. <laughs>
Now, as you may have gathered from the feeding studies that I showed earlier, the concentrations of UBFs and FPCs vary between trees. And that variation can occur both within and between eucalypt species. These two figures are from trees that we sampled on the north coast of New South Wales, where we measured both UBF and FPC concentrations in the leaves. Because some species are from the monocalypt subgenus and others are from the cynthia myrtle subgenus, some species have UBFs with no FPCs and others have FPCs with no UBFs. But what I really want to show you from these graphs is the amount of variation in plant secondary metabolite concentrations. So for example, if we look at the two species outlined in red on the UBF graph, you can see that the species on the left tends to have much higher UBF concentrations overall than the species on the right. But even within both species, you get a range of concentrations. So again, for the species outlined on the left, the concentration of UBS in some individual trees is below 20 milligrams per gram, while in other trees, it can be almost 80 milligrams per gram. So some trees have higher concentrations of UBS or FPCs than others, and it can depend not only on the species of tree, but also on the individual tree itself. And that variation between trees and species creates these chemically complex landscapes for folivores to navigate. So while a forest might look quite homogenous to us, a eucalypt folivore sees an array of trees ranging from some that they can eat lots of, like the one circled here, through to some that they can only nibble really small amounts from. And that's because even though koalas are fairly tolerant of FPCs, you can still find individual trees within a browse species that have FPC concentrations that exceed their tolerance levels. So I've talked quite a lot about plant secondary metabolites and eucalypt leaves and how they can deter feeding. But the other thing that I wanted to talk about was protein. So while eucalypt folivores are trying to avoid any negative effects of secondary metabolites, they're also trying to meet their requirements for protein and other nutrients. So protein is really important for a variety of physiological processes, including growth and reproduction, but eucalypt leaves are naturally quite low in protein. And on top of that, those low protein concentrations can be further exacerbated by the high concentrations of tannins that many eucalypt leaves contain. So some tannins combine to protein, making a portion of the protein in the plant indigestible. Tannins can be more effective against some animals than others, but when they are effective, less protein is available to animals to use for all of the things that they need it for. Available protein or available nitrogen, which is a proxy for protein, is an integrated measure that takes into account total amount of protein in leaves, as well as the potential for the tannins in those leaves to bind to protein and reduce its digestibility. This is a map of the available nitrogen concentration in trees in a eucalypt forest near Tumut in New South Wales. You can see that the landscape is quite patchy. So the dark areas have the highest available nitrogen concentrations and the light areas have the lowest. And this patchiness in nutrient availability has some really important implications for eucalypt folivores. One of those implications has to do with growth and reproduction. This figure illustrates that the breeding success of female brush-tailed possums increases as the mean concentration of available nitrogen increases within their home range. And you also get an increase in the rate at which pouch young grow when their mothers are living in home ranges where the trees have higher mean digestible nitrogen concentrations. So if we go back to this map here, you can start to see how large scale variation in habitat nutritional quality could affect the success of animal populations in different ways in different areas. So the areas with lots of yellows and pale green have available nitrogen concentrations that sit at the lower end of the breeding success of brush tail possums on the previous slides. The darker blues correspond with the concentrations where brush tails had much higher breeding success. 
dietary available nitrogen concentrations can also influence the capacity of eucalypt bolivores to consume foods containing secondary metabolites because they reduce the cost of detoxification. So eucalypt bolivores are more tolerant of higher secondary metabolite concentrations when leaves also contain more available nitrogen. So hopefully you've gathered that the nutritional quality of eucalypt leaves for marsupial bolivores is a combination of the availability of nutrients and the amount of deterrent secondary metabolites the leaves contain. So these chemical constituents work together to determine which trees a bolivore can eat and how much they eat from those trees. And we refer to that as how palatable the tree is. Trees that have a chemical composition that allow a particular folivore species to eat a lot are referred to as being highly palatable for that folivore species, while an unpalatable tree is one that has a chemical composition that would result in folivores choosing to eat little. This idea of palatability allows you to visualize an area as a palatability map that integrates the effects of the different chemicals. So in this case, it shows the way that a koala would see the Eucalyptus viminalis trees at the Koala Conservation Centre on Phillip Island. Each circle is an individual tree with the size of the circle representing the size of the tree. But what I really want you to look at is the differences in colour between the circles. Dark circles are trees that are not very palatable to koalas, while red circles are trees that are highly palatable. So this map clearly shows that eucalypt forests and woodlands are not just a black and white mix of food trees and non-food trees. Even within a species that is normally considered to be a food tree like eucalyptus viminalis, the trees can vary from highly palatable through to unpalatable. Now, it would be lovely if we could map all of Australia like this using this integrated measure of palatability and know where all of the best trees and the best habitats are for each marsupial folivore species. But unfortunately, it's not that simple because to be able to relate the chemical signature of thousands of different eucalypts to the amount eaten by folivores would require feeding studies on a scale that we just can't feasibly do. So, there is an alternative thing that we can do, even if we look at FPCs, UBFs and available nitrogen separately, we can still get an idea of how they work together to influence habitat quality and population densities. So this figure comes from a really large study that looked at the nutritional quality of eucalypts at more than 70 sites right across the distribution of koalas, which is where the stars are on the map on the right. The nutritional quality of the leaves was then compared to the density of koalas at those sites. Now the figure on the left shows three things. So first, koala densities were higher at sites with higher concentrations of available nitrogen. Second, koala densities were higher when sites contained lower average concentrations of FBCs. So the red points represent sites with a mixture of trees from different subgenera and an average FPC concentration less than 20 milligrams per gram. While the green points are sites with more than 20 milligrams per gram of FPCs on average. Now, finally, sites that only had species from the monocultural subgenus, which of course contains UBFs instead of FPCs, had the lowest densities of koalas. The relationship that we see here between nutrition and koala population densities is presumably due to a combination of the factors that I talked about earlier. So things like differences in the availability of palatable food, variation in breeding success of individuals, which all lead up to affecting animal populations. Now, one last thing I thought I'd touch on before I finish is what causes chemical variation between trees and species. And there's a lot that we don't fully understand about this, but three things that we do know contribute to chemical variation are leaf type, genetics, and environment. When we measure the nutritional quality of eucalypt trees and landscapes for marsupial folivores, we usually consider the chemical composition of mature eucalypt leaves. 
And that's because these types of leaves are present on most eucalypts year round and they form a large part of the diet of eucalypt folivores for most of the year. However, eucalypts do also produce new growth for a portion of the year. These leaves tend to have a slightly different nutritional composition from mature leaves growing on the same tree. They tend to have higher protein concentrations than mature leaves, but they can also have higher concentrations of tannins. And that combination means that they can end up with either higher or lower available nitrogen concentrations than mature leaves. They also tend to have higher concentrations of FPCs or UBFs. And what that means is that in some situations, new growth may be more nutritious for eucalypt folivores, but there's also the potential for them to be more strongly deterred from eating new growth. The other type of leaves that eucalypts produce at certain times are juvenile leaves. So juvenile leaves occur on seedlings and saplings, and they can also regrow as epicormic foliage after trees have been damaged, such as after fire. And like new growth, juvenile leaves can either be higher or lower in available nitrogen concentrations than mature leaves. And they also generally contain higher UBF or FPC concentrations. We also know that variation in plant secondary metabolite concentrations is under genetic control. The trees that are closely related are more likely to have similar secondary metabolite concentrations than unrelated trees. And secondary metabolite concentrations are highly heritable. You can also see the role of genetics in mosaic trees, such as the one in the picture here. So mosaic trees occur where you get a branch with different gene expression to the rest of the tree. So the tree in the picture has one branch with much higher concentrations of FPCs than the rest of the tree. And those high FPC concentrations protected that particular branch from herbivory when the leaves on the rest of the tree were eaten during an insect outbreak. There's also some environmental effects on nutrient and secondary metabolite concentrations, but they aren't very well understood yet. In at least some eucalypt species, FPC or UBF concentrations are higher at higher elevations, possibly because the secondary metabolites are playing a role in protecting eucalypt leaves against frost or photo damage. And the other interesting relationship between nutritional quality and elevation is that eucalypt leaves contain lower concentrations of sodium at higher elevations. Because sodium is so accessible to humans, we tend to focus on how bad it is to eat a high sodium diet. But sodium is an absolutely essential micronutrient and sodium deficiency can cause all sorts of problems with things like nerve transmission, growth and reproduction. And over time, it can even be fatal. In the Monero region of New South Wales, where you've got koalas living at elevations between 800 and 1200 metres above sea level, the concentration of sodium in eucalypt leaves is so low that koalas chew the bark off salty trees to meet their sodium requirements. So what these different things tell us is that we need to know a lot more about the interaction between elevation and nutritional quality for folivores before we assume that sites at high elevations will be suitable refugia for eucalypt folivores in response to climate change. Another environmental effect that's often assumed is that eucalypts growing on higher quality soils are more nutritious for folivores. And this in turn is thought to mean that the highest densities of eucalypt folivores will be found in the most fertile areas. However, there's no clear data to support this. And in fact, there are forests and woodlands growing on really poor soils that support very high densities of eucalypt folivores and have very nutritious trees. And a good example of that is Cape Otway um, and some of the offshore islands as well, where there are lots of koalas, but the soils are very sandy and nutrient poor. And yet the trees have some of the highest available nitrogen concentrations that we've ever measured. But given how pervasive the assumed relationship is between soil and leaf quality, there really needs to be a lot more work done to test whether that particular theory holds any weight.
So in summary, eucalypt leaves contain a variety of nutrients and plant second metabolites that influence food quality for eucalypt volleyballs. And the specific combination of chemical constituents means that some individual trees or eucalypt species are more palatable than others. Leaf nutritional composition is influenced by both genetic and environmental effects. And this means that landscapes are chemically comp complex mixtures of a range of palatable through to unpalatable trees, which affect the distribution and abundance of vulnerable populations. And I'd just like to thank the many, many people who've been part of the Plant Herbivore Group over the years and who have done all of the grunt work for the things that I've been talking about today. <laughs>